Sometimes life comes at you fast. Sometimes it beats you up pretty good. Sometimes you find yourself down on the ground, knees bruised, face bloody, bones broken, and it makes you wonder why life is so unfair. But on this video today, I'm going to teach you to the best of my ability, regardless, regardless of what has happened to you, how to stop being a victim. How to stop being a victim of circumstance, how to stop being a victim of people, how to stop being a victim of whatever you've been being a victim of. And we're going to look at a story in scripture today that is so mind-blowing. And I went back and reviewed the whole story again. And it's amazing how our experiences of life follow our thoughts and our words. So, here we go. It says in Genesis chapter 42, verse 35 and 36, and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. That's an interesting thing. Why were they afraid? Well, they were afraid because they went to Egypt to buy food and they paid for the food. But Joseph, without saying it, demonstrated your money's no good here. And he put their money back in their sacks. And they were afraid that he was going to think they stole it. Okay, that's why they were afraid. Okay, y'all track him. Then it says, And Jacob their father said unto them, Me ye have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, which means Joseph is dead. And Simeon is not. And ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. That's the, that's the phrase right there. All these things are against me. I want to ask you a question. And be honest with yourself, because you don't need to tell me. I'm all right. Be honest with yourself. How many times in your life have you said, all these things are against me? And in your mind, you really believed in your heart of hearts that these things were the reason your life wasn't working. Can I get a witness? Here, more times than we care to count. Can I get a witness? Well, the reality is, that's one perspective. But we, we're not done reading. That's, that's the first one. Then we go down to Genesis 47. This is after Jacob found out that Joseph is alive, after he found out that his son was running the land of Egypt. Even Pharaoh looked at Joseph as a father. It says in Genesis 47, 7, and Joseph brought Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Cool. 130 years. That's, that sounds pretty good to most of us, doesn't it? 130 years? Let it sign me up right now. I, right now. Okay. But then he says, few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained unto the days of the years of my father's in the days of their pilgrimage. Few, wait, 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 wait. T time out, bruh. You thought your son was dead for probably at least a decade. You find out he's alive and he's not just alive. He's running the deal. What deal? The whole deal. Everybody in the world had to come get food from Jacob, I mean from Joseph. He's alive. He's in charge and living large. And the best thing you could think of to say was, few and evil have been the days of the years of my pilgrimage. I'm so confused. Dude, you just found out your son is alive. How can you think anything that has ever happened to you was evil? Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? 
So how do we stop being a victim? So I'm, before I tell you how to stop being a victim, I want to say this. This, is, this video is for everybody who thinks their life isn't working because of some external circumstance or some person other than themselves. That's who this video is for. Stop being a victim. Because I'm going to tell you something. Your thought, your thoughts that you are a victim and your words about you being a victim have victimized you more than any other external circumstance could or has. I'm not minimizing the, the idea that really difficult things and some really, quote, bad things have happened to all of us. But flip it over. What? The bad thing that happened to you, the difficult thing that happened to you, the trial that you went through, the trial that you're going through. Flip it over. What do I mean flip it over? There's a law that... Is, that is a law that governs our experience of life. It's called the law of polarity. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For every positive, there's a negative, and every negative, there's a positive. And when a negative shows up, we get so zoned into the negative that we forget to flip it over and look at the other side. Well, my life ain't working because racism. I, okay, I'm not gonna deny that racism is real. Racism is real, but it can't stop you. Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a woman in a man's world. Okay, women have it harder in a man's world. Cool. But that can't stop you. I mean, it can give you an excuse if you want to sit on one. I know some, some people are not going to like the fact that I said that. But I don't care. I'm not going to lie to you to make you feel good. Hey, I was born May 14th, 1961, right here in Tampa, Florida. In a time when it was illegal Everybody say illegal. It was illegal for black people to move from Florida up north unless they already had a job up north. It was illegal. That really happened. I was born in a segregated hospital because I was not allowed to be born in Tampa General. I was born in Clara Fry Memorial Hospital. Six or seven years after the polio vaccine was discovered. And guess what? I contracted polio and they couldn't even figure out what was wrong with me. I didn't get treated or diagnosed for it until my parents moved to Pennsylvania with two small babies and one of them was sick. I could be mad at the world. Man, racism ruined my life. By the way, by the way, if you're white, because we got some white folks watching, <laughs> and you're listening to this, don't use this to show, to prove to black people what you've been trying to tell them. You haven't earned the right to do that. I'm just keeping it real. I've earned the right. Because I'm me. I'm just talking about my experience. I remember I was on a, I was on a clubhouse, um, in a clubhouse room one time, and I was talking about the fact, people talk, uh, people talk about disability, this disability, that. I said, I don't, I don't have a disability. I just have different abilities. Two people that were on there who liked the term disabilities got mad at me. Okay. Uh, Myron, you shouldn't say that because we really do have disabilities. Okay, if y'all want to have disabilities, have them. I don't have one. I just have different, different abilities. See, because here's what I know. Every weakness creates strength. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to focus on the weakness that came out of your circumstance, then focus on that. But I'm going to focus on the strength. Yeah. The weakness is still there, but the weakness can't stop me. Anyway, so I contracted polio. Now, I'm going to tell you about this. Because polio is a neuromuscular disease that attacks the nerves in your spine that control certain parts of your body. So... So my left leg didn't develop as fast as the rest of me. My left leg is like, like really much smaller, much weaker than my right leg. So I have to walk with a brace on my leg. And without my brace on my leg, I can't walk unless it's with crutches. Oh, woe is me. My life is so terrible. Right? I, I mean, I, I could do that, but I'm not going to be a victim. Because I realize, okay, first of all, Nothing gets past God. And he is sovereign. Uh, now I'm going to really mess with y'all because good doctrine is hard to come by. <laughs> Nothing gets past God. And 
because nothing gets past God, not only did he approve it and allow it, he ordained it because God's sovereign. And the reason you resist the difficulties that you're going through and the difficulties that you've gone through is because somewhere in your heart of hearts, you think you know better than God. Okay, give me, a, give me a wide view. I want them to be able to see. I want them to be, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it. So, okay, cool. So this, this is my brace. So every morning when I get dressed, I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to get back into the Bible study. I, I want you to understand the person talking to you is not somebody who's never gone through anything. So this shoe, this shoe is a size 12. This foot, that other foot is a size 12. This foot, probably a size six and a half. That much smaller. When I was 13 years old, 13. I say, why do you keep hitting the brace with that shoe? Because it makes a sound and it's really cool. Um, when I was 13 years old, my left leg was two whole inches shorter than my right leg. The doctors came to my parents, said, Mr. and Mrs. Golden, we got an operation can help your son. We can stretch his leg two inches. I'm 13 years old. I have a very wild and vivid imagination. Not quite as wild and vivid as it is now, but a very wild and vivid imagination. I had seen Gumby and the Fantastic Four. <laughs> I had no medical degree, but I knew bones ain't made out of rubber. And he said, this is what we're going to do. He said, we're going to take... We're going to take the tibia, which is, which is the big bone, which is the big bone in the middle of his shin, and we're going to break it in the middle. We're going to take the fibula, which is the little bone, and we're going to break it at the top and break it at the bottom. I know, y'all thinking, he should have been an artist. We'll deal with that later. Okay. So then he said, what we're going to do is we're going to put these screws. I'm talking about screws with threads on them. We're going to put these screws through the tibia, not through the, not through the fibula. There's two screws through the top. Two screws through the bottom. And we're going to put it on this metal rack. It has a knob right here in the middle, and these things, these, this is two different bars, and they slide. And we're going to put this on a metal rack with these two different bars, and they slide. It's got a knob in the middle, and we're going to come turn these knobs one half turn daily. And it's going to stretch this bone apart, not Napoleon bone apart. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. My brain just does that. I'm just, okay, we're going to stretch this bone apart. And at the end of 30 days, how long? 30 days. 30 days, his leg's going to be stretched two inches. He's going to have to be in the hospital for a whole month, and he won't be able to go to school. I said, sign me up. <laughs> Can y'all do both of them? Get two months out of this deal? I was ready. You never saw a kid so excited about getting his leg broken in your life. I'm going to be in here a whole month? Okay. <laughs> Just keep it real. That's what I thought. Okay, so guess what? Two weeks in, there was a problem. There was a problem. I was 13. I was growing so fast that even though they were turning these knobs, I have turned a day, the bone was growing back together too fast. And they came in and said, we're not going to make two inches. So I did what any self-respecting 13-year-old boy would do. I cried. <laughs> Call my parents. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> okay, we're coming, we're coming. So my parents come down, we have this meeting with the doctor, and then he starts telling them the same thing. And I'm 13. Like, I had not yet been to medical school. <laughs> and I'm listening to this conversation, and it didn't make sense to me. The bone's growing back together too fast. We're not going to make two inches. I said, Dr. Larrick, can I ask you a question? He said, Sure. I said, we're only turning it a half a turn a day. Why don't we turn it a whole turn? I mean, I know I'm only 13, but that just seems like a logical question to me. He said, well, we could do that, but it might hurt. I'm like, hurt? My leg's already broke. We're already here. Let's go. Why are you tripping? Now, 
I don't just tell you. By the way, this, is, this was one of the greatest experiences of my life. What did the psalmist say? Teach me to know joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Not some other bones. This was, this was no, hear me now. This was one of the greatest experiences of my life. When I was a kid, I hated the fact that I had polio. I've got six brothers. Come from a family of athletes. Everybody can run but me. Since I couldn't run, I learned how to fight. (laughs) And when I was a kid, this is real talk, I couldn't even say the word polio without tears welling up in my eyes. Couldn't even say the word. That's how painful it was for me. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you deserve to know that you're not listening to somebody who's never been through anything. Yeah. You're not listening to somebody, oh, I've just been on top my whole life. I'm faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Where's my, somebody bring me my cape. <laughs> no, I'm just a regular guy who's had stuff to go through and stuff to go through. Like I went through stuff as a child that no child should have to go through. People making fun of me, people calling me names, people picking on me, people pushing me down, always getting picked last on the playground. And as hard as all of it was, and all of it was hard, it all made me better. So why do I tell you this story? Because this is not just my leg story, this is your life story. Whose life everybody type yourself and just say my life. This is your life story. What does that mean? Well, this is like, just like my leg, there was a plan, right? It was a 30-day plan. You can change your life in 30 days. But you have to pick when your 30 days is going to start. <laughs> you can change your life in 30 days. Hey, guess what? Whether they are going to turn it a half turn or a whole turn, they had to do it daily. If you are going to change your life, it's going to require some daily discipline. You can't do stuff every now and then. So many entrepreneurs wonder why they struggle. Because half the days of the week, they forget they're in business. <laughs> Requires daily disciplines to produce transformation, results, prosperity, abundance, a new life. You got to do something every day. It has to be consistent. But wait a minute. Two weeks in, there was a problem. Disruption always follows intention. When you get ready to do something new, something good, the first thing that shows up is something hard. Isn't it amazing how like, like these principles just keep repeating themselves over and over? I am not, hey, listen to me. I am not making light of the difficulties you've been through. I know you've been through difficulties. Here's the problem. Sometimes you think you're the only one. But here's who's been, here's who's been through difficulty. Everybody. Some more painful than others. Like, but I tell you what, I'd rather have mine than yours. Some of y'all look at me like, oh, poor thing. I, poor thing right back to you. Well, but what if they had put these screws through my leg and they had turned these knobs every day for 30 days, but they wouldn't have broken it first. It wouldn't have stretched at all. Why? Because seldom in life can we be stretched. What's the word I just used? Everybody, what's the word? Stretched to our full potential unless we're first broken. So we've got to go through something to get to something. And so many of us are unwilling to go through what we've got to go through in order to get to what we desire to get to. And so we come to this place that might break us. And there's a wall there. And then somebody who cares about us and has been over the wall says, climb over the wall. And because you believe so much in your limitations, you say, I can't, it's too high. Then go around the wall. I can't, it's too far. Go through the wall. It's too high. Here's a shovel. Dig under the wall. It's too deep. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. See, I had to go through this. Why? There's no destiny without difficulty. 
There's no advancement without adversity. There's no strength without struggle. So you want to be strong. You want to have strength without the struggle. You want to have advancement without the adversity. You want to have destiny without the difficulty. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere in nature. You will not be the first person in the history of the world to hit your destiny with no difficulty. Look, show them the, show them the four. I'm going to get back to my size 12. You say, well, what's up in the toe? Air. Okay. <laughs> so, so I got this brace on my leg. And so it creates all kinds of issues. But I want to show you all some stuff because I was going to take it off, but I'm not going to take it off. I just want to show you this is how life works. I'm not a victim of this. I'm a victor because of this. And I promise you, if I wanted to, if I would have had parents who would have told me how woe I was, woe is me, and told me all the things I couldn't do, I probably be, would be a victim of thinking that I'm a victim. Did y'all hear what I just said? So, so when I wear this brace, because when I got my leg stretch operation, I'm, I'm gonna get into the how to stop being a victim in a minute, but I just want, like, some, how many of y'all know sometimes you just need to know who's talking to you? Yeah. Okay, so you can see clearly that this leg is not very big, right? It's not strong, like, that's it. That's what it does, it does that. <laughs> oh, poor thing, I'm all right. So, so, <laughs> don't forget that part. So, like, is he really taking his shoes off? He is, he's taking his socks off too. So, and no, my feet don't stink, so don't even sweat that. Okay, so, so here's what's interesting. Because you have a whole bunch of stuff in here, not just two bones, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. There's tendons and ligaments. There's a, there's a tendon in the back of your leg, what's it called? Well, they just stretched those two bones. What about the Achilles? What are we gonna do with that? It's still the same length. What are we gonna do? We gotta cut it. We gotta cut it. We gotta cut the Achilles. So, we got cut that. So then, because the, the, the fibula is a smaller bone, it didn't stretch as much as the tibia, so now instead of my leg being bowed this way, which it was, now it's bowed this way, which now put pressure on my toe. Y'all see this thing on my toe? Put pressure on my toe, so I kept getting this callus on the bottom of my toe. And it kept getting bigger and bigger, and then I have to shave it off, get bigger and bigger. So they said, oh, I don't know what we'll do, we'll fuse your toe. So, so what they did was they cut open the top of my toe, like this, this toe doesn't, it only bends at the top joint. It don't, it don't bend down here. And so they, 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 they cut open the top, they fused the bone together, and then they stuck a metal rod, like a nail, all the way in to hold it in place until that fusing like solidified. But still, even, even though, because my leg is this way, now I get calluses on the foot. So I gotta put callus pads on the bottom of my foot. <laughs> Poor thing, it's just so sad that my life is so horrible. I can't believe I have to do this stuff. Chow, please. I have to wear, I have to wear, when I, when I wear these, my dress socks, I only have to wear one tube sock inside to keep this from irritating, to keep this brace from irritating my leg. But it also irritates my leg up here. So I got all this stuff going on. This is, this is my life. This is my every day. Right? But I'm not a victim of it. I'm a guy who's been, I was blessed enough to have polio as an infant so that I would develop strengths that I could not develop otherwise. There's no universe in which I can help people to the degree that I helped them now had I not gone through this. See, somehow we bought into all this fairy tale stuff about, you know, everything's supposed to be hunky-dory. Everything's supposed to be kind of picture perfect. And then, you know, happily ever after and all that, that's fine. But stop acting like you're a victim of anything other than the fact that you think you're a victim. Whatever you, wherever you are in life, you are not there because somebody did it to you. Yeah, I get it. Hey, Frederick Douglass was born a slave and died a free man who freed hundreds of others. Helen Keller was, was blind and deaf 
and became an author and you think you have an excuse. I'm not denying that difficult things have happened to all of us. And, and, and I resist calling them bad. Now, why do I resist calling them bad? Well, Joseph's brothers did a bad thing to him. What they did was bad. They threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. They threw him in a pit. Then they were going to sell him into slavery, but the Midianites got to him before they could, and so they didn't even get to make any money off the deal. <laughs> And, and his brothers hated him for his dreams and his words. And guess what? There are people who are close to you that when you have dreams, they will hate you for your dreams and your words. People who are close to you. And so, the, uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but it'll come back to me. And so, I've got all of this stuff. Oh, bad. We call it bad. So Joseph's brothers did a bad thing to him. But you know what Joseph said to them when they thought he was going to get them back because they thought his motives were like their motives? He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it. Meant it what? Your evil for good. God meant the evil of all the evildoers who did evil to you for good. They couldn't have done the evil to you. If you, why did, I can't understand why a good and loving God would let evil in the world. Well, of course you can't. You ain't, a good, you ain't a good or a loving God. How could you understand it? If I had a dog, my dog couldn't understand how I go to work when I go to work. And drive, how does he drive a car? He's a dog. If I, if I had a dog, my dog would have a better understand. Better chance of understanding how and why I do what I do than you have of understanding why and how God does what he does. How about that? You say, Myron, what are you saying? I'm saying stop being a victim. So how do I stop being a victim? Okay. So here's number one. How do you stop being a victim? Stop catastrophizing your burdens. What does that mean? Stop taking all of the difficult things that have happened to you in your life and catastrophizing them, turning, magnifying, amplifying, and multiplying them like they were a catastrophe. I get it. They were hard. I get it. They were difficult. I get it. The people who did them were wrong. I get that. I'm not denying that at all. I'm telling you, it does not serve you to go through life thinking they did this to me. Because they can't do nothing to me. Nelson Mandela was in prison for decades in his body. But in his mind, he was running the most successful presidential campaign in the history of the world. Y'all tracking? See, what goes on in here is infinitely more important than what goes on out there. Stop catastrophizing your burdens. It's so amazing. You are, you know what's really interesting about Jacob's whole story? He created it. You know what the Bible tells us about, ja about Jacob? He loved Joseph more than he loved his other sons. His love that he had for Jacob that was more than the love he had for his other sons is what started his other sons to hating him. How can a parent love one child more than another? That's fascinating. Anyway. That's what Joseph did. But stop catastrophizing. What if instead of all of the difficult, tough things, evil things that other people have done to us, people, organizations, governments, whatever, instead of all of that, instead of like focusing in on all of the wrong that's been done to you, what if you go take inventory of all the good that's come out of it? But Myron, who am I going to blame? When you get done doing that, there'll be nobody to blame. Stop catastrophizing. Okay? What else? Well, stop comparing your bounty. What does that mean? Few and evil have been the days. I'm only 130. My days have not attained to the days of my fathers and their fathers. 
Stop comparing. What does the scripture tell us? They that compare themselves among themselves, measuring themselves by themselves, are not wise. Stop comparing. The only person in the history of the world who's ever had your assignment is you. What are you comparing yourself to somebody else for? Yeah, but you don't understand. Like, like Abraham lived to be 175, and, and, and Isaac, my father, he lived to be 180, and I'm only 130. <laughs> Bruh. Bruh. Do you understand if you're comparing yourself to other people, it's easy to persuade yourself and think that you're persuading others that you are a victim. But if you try to persuade me that you're a victim, I ain't buying it. I'm not saying nobody's ever done anything bad to you. Because people, there are some evil people in the world. But if we, learn to, if we learn to apply James chapter 1 to every difficulty of our life, Rob, can you warm it up in here? I think people are cold. <laughs> I'm not cold. I feel really good right now. I don't have a jacket on. Okay, so... Um, if we, if we just ask ourselves, God, if we start applying James chapter one to all of the difficulties in our lives, it would change our lives forever. What does James chapter one say? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Here's what count means. Count is a perspective word. Here's what the scripture says. Have the joy of perspective when difficulty comes. Have the perspective of joy. My brethren, count it all joy. That doesn't mean, oh, I just love it when I get in. Like, oh, man, when the car breaks down in the rain and I don't have triple A, this is so great. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying count it all joy. He said count it all joy when you fall into diverse, different kinds of temptation. And that word temptation is not temptation like you're tempted to punch somebody in the face. It's tempted, temptation like it's a trial. You're tempted to lose faith. You're tempted to doubt. You're tempted to believe that it's not going to work. Are y'all tracking? The scripture says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this. Knowing is a perception word. So here's what the scripture is telling us. We can only have the right perspective when we have the right perception. You know, why your you know why your perspective's off? Because your perception's off. So I want to know, when it says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations knowing this, I want to know what the this is that I'm supposed to know. Can I get a witness? Where are my people? Like, what is the this I need to know in order to count like I'm supposed to count? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, not because you like falling into different kinds of trials, but count it all joy because you know that the trial that you're going through is the thing that's going to make, give you patience. What's patience? Persistent, consistent endurance. It's the trials that we go through that make us stronger. So I'm counting it joy, not because I love trials. I don't love the fact that my leg won't hold me. It won't even hold itself. I don't love that, but I love the person that that has made me become. I love the opportunity to demonstrate the grace of God in the midst of imperfection. Are y'all tracking? Like if you, stop, if you stop catastrophizing your burdens and you stop comparing yourself, well, I've got six brothers and they can run and I can't run and I can't run. Imagine how much more tired they are than me. <laughs> I know, that was ridiculous. <laughs> I know, right? Pray for me. Um, count it all joy knowing this, that the trying of your faith work of patience. Here's what's really cool. Like, it's like, like, while God's having James write this, he's reading our mind at the same time. Because he says then, he says, but let patience have her perfect work. In other words, let the trial do what the trial was designed to do. What does that mean? As soon as you get in, tri in difficult time, dear God, please get me out of this trial. God's like, I just put you in that trial. You got to learn the lesson to receive the blessing. And the only place you're going to learn the lesson is in the trial. You want me to take you out of the trial? Take you out of the testing so you don't learn the lesson. So then you got to keep on testing. 
No, God said, I just put you in that trial. I love the fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are an Old Testament illustration of this. And I love the fact that it says when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar charged his most mighty men to throw um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, it says these men fell down bound in their coats and their hats and their hosen. And they stayed in there. And they were going to say, wait, 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 time out. Didn't we throw three men in the fire? Yes, O king. Why is he four men loose walking in the midst of the fire? Notice, not coming out of the fire, walking in the midst of the fire. See, you want to get out of the trial and that's your primary objective. God wants you to get from the trial what he designed for you to get from the trial. And guess what? You will never get from the trial what God designed for you to get from the trial as long as you're playing the victim card. Y'all tracking? So stop catastrophizing your burdens. Stop comparing your bounty and start counting your blessings. Jacob, what are you doing? What are you doing? If you and evil have been the days and years of my life. Really? If you had stayed in Canaan, you would have died. All your cattle would have died. All your children would have died. You're in Egypt, and your son is running the show, and... He gave you the best land in the whole country. And all you can do is catastrophize, catastrophize, cry, and complain, and compare? Really? Okay. The stuff that happened to Jacob, guess who else it happened to? Like, Jacob's son was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery. But Jacob wasn't the only person that happened to. Who else did it happen to? It happened to Joseph. He was all up in the mix. He got sold into slavery. He got thrown in a pit by his brothers, and there was no water in the pit. I love the the detail of the Bible. And there was no water in the pit. And the Midianites came and took him out, and they sold him to some Sabians, to, I think to the Sabians. Anyway, they took him down to Egypt. He's working in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. Joseph said, oh, my master has given me control over his whole house. And he let, me, he let me in charge of everything but you. I am not going to do this great evil against my, against my God and against my man. I ain't doing it. So she tried to seduce him, and she took his coat, lied on him. And I, this is so good. It says when, she, when her husband came home and he told her, it says his anger was kindled. And he put Joseph in prison. His anger weren't kindled against Joseph. He would have killed him if his anger would have been kindled against Joseph. His anger was kindled against his wife because he knew she was a slut. But he said, I got to do something to save face. So he put Joseph in prison. Now Joseph's in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And then the butler forgot about him. Guess what? God was getting him ready for what God already had ready for him. And God has been getting you ready your whole life. And you've been singing the Jacob song. All these things are against me. And few and evil have been the days of the life of my pilgrimage. So much so that God can't even give you what he has ready for you because you ain't yet ready for it. Because God's gifts are not for victims. Because we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Wait a minute, doesn't it say, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. That means me being born in a segregated hospital and contracting polio and having a left leg that doesn't work for the most part and having an operation and multiple operations and surgeries and going through all the difficulty of being made fun of and being pushed down the steps when I was on crutches when I was recuperating and having some little kid in church when I had that 
pin in my toe, jumped up in the air and landed on my foot because he wanted to do a little, like all of that. He's just a little kid. He, he didn't mean anything bad by it. He was, I wonder what would happen if I do this. <laughs> oh, trust me. I feel it every time I think about it. <laughs> all of that stuff was part of the preparation for all of this stuff. But I wouldn't be ready for this stuff if I had resisted it all. Because what you resist persists. But what you embrace becomes grace, and grace is a gift. And you, you've been lamenting your lamentations your whole life. You've been cursing your curses your whole life. What if the thing that God has for you to do is so big that only the person who's gone through what you've gone through can do it. Stop being a victim. Jacob, Joseph went through the same thing. Here's what Joseph did. He had a son. His son's name was Manasseh. You know what he named his son? You know why he named his son Manasseh? Because Manasseh means God has made me to forget all of the toil and the pain of my father's house. See, you are intentionally holding in your memory all of the toil, all of the torment, all of the trials, because it makes you feel noble and it makes you feel like this is the reason my life isn't working. Not what J That's not what Joseph did. He had another son. His other son's name was Ephraim. E Ephraim. E Ephraim. But Ephra we say Ephraim. Ephraim, what does Ephraim mean? God has made me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. See, here's the problem. We want the fruitfulness without the land of the affliction. God says, this ain't that. You get both or you get neither. Stop going through life looking for someone to blame for the fact that your life isn't working. And thank God for all the stuff you've been lamenting and ask him to show you. Back to James chapter one. Here's what it says. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect or mature and entire, wanting nothing. What does it say after that? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That is not a generic, isolated verse. He's saying, if you lack the wisdom to count it all joy, ask God for the wisdom to count it all joy. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him, what? The wisdom to count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. This is so complete. You are not a victim of what happened to you. You're not a victim of... Black folks, if you're white, you're not a victim of white folks and racism if you're black. You're not a victim of men if you're a woman, woman if you're a man. You're not a victim of the government. The government's evil, get it, but I get it, but it's the government. But you're not a victim of it. You're not a victim of your corporation or your boss or the coworker who doesn't like you. You're a victim and only a victim of the idea that you're a victim. And that has done you more harm than all of the evil that anyone else has ever done. Let it go. I hope this blesses you. I hope it helps you see a perspective of the difficulties that you've been through in your life that are on a level that's beyond woe is me. And I look forward to seeing you on our next Bible study. God bless. Bye for now.